our scripture from Acts is Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. This is the NRSV today. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which is the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now, I've heard it, this in parentheses, that this is like a pause, uh, just as a reminder. That this may have even, Peter may not have even really said this, but this may be added uh, just to clarify. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. Yeah. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their language, Hakaldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it. And, and let another take his position of overseer. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord was, went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. And everybody said, Amen. I will tell you that that is the last time in the Bible that they cast lots. If you think about it, and casting lots, that it may have been drawing straws. Some, some commentaries say it was putting two names in a, on rocks, writing names on rocks, or giving, assigning each one a rock, dumping it out. Um, others say rolling dice. That was the last time in the Bible that they figured out God's will that way. Why do, they not have to, why do we not have to do that today? Because God sent his spirit to dwell in us, and if we are attuned to that, we shouldn't have to say, okay, if I make this shot, then you want me to go. Has anybody ever done that? I'm glad you didn't raise your hands because I didn't raise mine either. So some of you know, and I have this one thing written at the end of this first part of the sermon, but I want to, since we have a few new people with us today, I want to put this disclaimer out at the beginning before I start, and that is, I don't talk about Diane and I every week. So just know that. As a matter of fact, I didn't even talk about Diane and I the first week here. I have just preached the word every week. Some, of, some people don't know really very much about us because I haven't really talked a lot about us, but in this scripture today and, and what I'm going to get to today, I just found it pertinent and relevant uh, to share a little bit with you at the beginning here. So some of you know, and many of you do not know, that Diane and I owned and operated a restaurant for about 12 or 13 years. There was this restaurant, it was a, like a Dairy Queen, but it was an independent place, and my grandmother opened it in 1954, and in 1985, uh, well, in 1954, my grandmother and grandfather opened this place. It was a Tasty Freeze, if you ever heard of a Tasty Freeze, and then they weren't to build another Tasty Freeze, the Tasty Freeze Corporation wasn't to build another Tasty Freeze in that county, well, they did, barely. 
like one mile inside the county line in Payton City, they built a Tasty Freeze. And so my grandfather broke contract with the Tasty Freeze Corporation and they became independent. At the age of 42, 43, in the early 60s, my grandfather died. My grandfather's name was Paul. My first name's Paul. The reason I don't go by Paul is because they didn't want two Pauls, so it could be confusing. So they called me by my middle name, which is Scott. Well, if they had known my grandfather was going to die when I was two, they probably may have just called me Paul, but we don't know those things, do we? So they called me Scott, and two years into it, it's too late to change my name. And so my grandmother is left with three kids, three boys, and a business, and my grandfather's gone. And so my grandmother put on her big girl pants and plowed forward. And she raised three boys, sent one through medical school. I have an uncle who's a doctor in Atlanta. And uh, my grandmother in 1984 found out she had cancer. So my grandmother owned the business for 30 years, found out she had cancer. And in 1985, Diane and I were dating. We were in Morgantown. We went back, operated the restaurant for her for a while until she passed away. And then we bought the restaurant from the family. In 1985, we moved back to Sistersville, where I was from, and we uh, were looking for a church because we were going to get married. And so we were looking for a church, and we went to the Church of Christ. We went to Presbyterian Church. I don't even remember where we went, but we went, you know, church shopping, and we really liked the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church. And we remember the first time even we went there, the preacher wasn't there, but there was a guy named Adam Kelly who was the editor of the Tyler Star News, and he spoke, and he was interesting. And so then we went back, and the preacher was there, and he was a fire and brimstone preacher, and we liked him a lot, and he performed the wedding ceremony. And then uh, within a couple years, he had an affair with the secretary, and uh, this is true. Had an affair with the secretary who was about 25 years younger than him and left his wife and he and the secretary got married. And so he left the church, which is probably fitting, <laughs> right? <laughs> Amen? Uh, that's why I'm United Methodist today. It's because the people were nice to me and Diane. They were nice. We liked it there. That's why we're United Methodist. It doesn't have anything to do with John Wesley. When we started going there, we didn't even know the preachers moved. I mean, we, when he moved because of that, we, but, you know, the United Methodist Church moves their preachers around. We didn't even know that when we started going there. So, Diane was pretty faithful all through that about taking the boys to church. I wasn't faithful about going. I always found excuses not to go. Fast forward to 2000. Amen. You all happy? I'm fast forwarding to 2000. So you don't have to hear about 1986 to 2000. 2000, uh, I start work. We closed the restaurant. We probably wouldn't still be married today if we kept the restaurant open because I wasn't a Christian. I don't really think Diane was a believer then yet either, but uh, I can't speak for her. But uh, it is, the restaurant business is tough and uh, I wasn't a believer, and so I wasn't, I'm sure, the best husband, and thank you for not saying amen. I even said that before I gave you a chance to say amen. <laughs> wasn't the best husband, so we closed the restaurant, and I started selling homes, modular and manufactured homes. And I sold this house to this guy named Chris Kuntz, who sings with a group called One Accord. And I had mentioned a couple weeks ago that I'm not really a big fan of gospel music, but... Chris and his friends sang gospel music. They invited us to hear him sing. I went because it was Chris. I sold him a house and I liked him. So I went to hear him sing. We went to a, a Christian Brethren Church in Ravenswood, West Virginia. And our oldest son and myself got saved there. I didn't know it was the last day of revival. He didn't tell me that. <laughs> but it was the last day of a revival. And we went there, and my oldest son and I got saved there. And, and it changed everything for me, as you can imagine. So 
The next year, we went back, and our youngest son got saved there at the same church at, at the gospel. So I became more involved in the church after that, and I'm not saying that I never went out at a sporting event again and made a horse's padoot out, out of myself. Uh, I did. You know, in the church, in the United Methodist Church, we believe in this thing called sanctification. You're saved and you're justified, and then you're sanctified for the whole rest of your life. And sanctified means that you hopefully grow more like Jesus as you keep going. And I'm, you know, when I got saved, I had plenty of room to grow. I still have plenty of room to grow. So I am on a journey. And the United Methodist Church says, on a journey of Christ-like holiness, to become like Christ all through this journey. Uh, the secretary at my work, she really, I talked about her a few weeks ago because she had a daughter who went to Crown College in Tennessee, and I mentioned the young people who were killed in the accident. And she was Baptist, and she really uh, helped me to, to learn, and then I listened to sermons on the internet from this guy named Clarence Sexton, and in, 2000, in the early 2000s, in 2000 I got saved. I've only been a Christian for 13 years. I've only been a follower of Jesus for 13 years. I've been a preacher for six of those years. So seven years after I became a Christian, I became a pastor. Why in the world are they doing so, somebody who's only been a Christian for seven years, putting them in a pulpit? But thanks to Martha, I went to licensing school in 2007, one week with Martha, and I was ready to be a preacher. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and if you don't know, Martha was the preacher here two months ago. Uh, one week I was attending church as part of Sistersville First United Methodist Church, and the next week I was standing in front of the church preaching the Word of God. How unbelievable is that? Seven years after becoming a Christian. Fast forward to 2012, and you're going, that's not fast forward. Yeah, fast forward to 2012. We had been at Mason, United Methodist Church, for five years. The church had done amazing things there. And, our dist and I had really kept a low profile. I didn't go to any conference stuff. I didn't go to any district meetings. Uh, we were just minding our own business in that little church, keeping our heads down because I didn't want to be moved. I didn't want to draw attention to the church, but the church was doing so many great things that the district superintendent in 2012 said, we're going to feature your church at annual conference this year in Buchanan. So in 2012, and if it wasn't six minutes long, I was going to show you the video from that church today. They showed a six-minute video of that church at conference last year in 2012, and it blew the lid off of the Mason church. And then everybody's coming up to me at conference. Oh, you should be bragging about your church. You never told me in residency about... Okay. Then, so God used a district superintendent to draw attention to our church, and God used a new district superintendent, I believe, Martha, to bring me here. Martha would have had say, and I haven't heard this from Martha, but I do deductive reasoning, and I... I can imagine Martha sitting in on those cabinet meetings. She would have had some say about who came here. And she knew about the church that I left. So you can thank Martha or cuss Martha because she had a large part of me and Diane coming here. So this is where I had, and for you who are here the first time today, I don't spend the whole sermon normally talking about us. But I want you to see what I see in how God used all these times in my life that I have just described to you. 
I want you to see how God used those to prepare me for this. Do you understand what I'm saying? The restaurant business, I'm thinking that's about making money and that's about... And I learned so much in the restaurant business uh, that's helping me today. I learned how to deal with people. I was going to say problem people, but I won't say that. I learned how to deal with people in the restaurant business. You can imagine. I learned how to cook food and prepare food in the restaurant business. That's coming in mighty handy right now with 90 and 100 people coming to dinner every week. That's pretty handy. And I don't want to brag, but everybody keeps telling me that the food's pretty good. I learned that in the restaurant business. Can you see how God was preparing me for this? The Methodist Church. Now you know why I'm Methodist. It's not because I think we have the best theology. It was the people. That's why I'm Methodist. But God knew which church we needed to go to when I wasn't even a Christian yet. I and mean, I'm getting cold chills. Isn't it amazing? God knew which church I need to go to God, to get me right here, right now, on this day. And it was my choice to go to that church. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't believe that God just moves all the pieces and that we're just pawns and that we don't have a say in things. We do, but God knew which church I needed to go to. And I don't know how that all works out. And now, here we are at this 150-year-old church in Short Gap, West Virginia, about 150 years old, I don't know. I've been doing some reading about the church. It's about 150 years old. This building isn't, of course, but the church itself. The, and I can look back and see how God was preparing me for this. Even the six years at Mason, it was just about teaching me how to be a pastor. I didn't know how to be a pastor. Even the six years there was preparing me for this, for what God is about to do here. So now, let's get to the scripture, and I don't want to hear any amens. But Matthias and Peter, that's who I want to mostly talk about right now. Peter was being prepared to stand up as the 120 gathered, to pick a new apostle, because Judas obviously is out of the picture now. And I want to say one thing about Judas, and I'll preach about this sometime, but man, if you ever go through a rough spell, and you will, some of you may be in one right now, uh, I, I love the thought of what if Judas had waited three days? What if Judas had just waited three days? You know, he rats out Jesus, he brings the enemy in, and he shows them where Jesus is, and he kisses them on the cheek, and they know that's Jesus, and they take Jesus away, and, and then Judas kills himself because he can't live with what he's done. What if he had just waited three days? Do you think Jesus would have forgiven him? You know he would have. What if he had just waited? Oh, and then Judas would have been the disciple that everybody wanted to talk to. Judas would have been the one who was saying, yeah, I'm the one who ratted him out and brought the guards to where he was, and, and then he forgave me. He'll forgive you. <laughs> you know, what you did has nothing compared to what I did, but Judas didn't wait. So, for, so I'll preach about that sometime, about when we go through tough times, about how we just have to wait sometimes. But Peter is now the de facto leader. Because Jesus has gone out of the picture, gone back, you know, we've talked about this the last couple weeks, gone back to heaven, ascended to be back with God. He's going to send this Holy Spirit. And right now, Peter's the man. And Peter has been prepared his whole life to stand up right now and take charge of what's going to become the church. And I can imagine Peter going, yeah, I remember when I was, even just a, a couple days ago, and, or, well, at this point, it would have been a month or so ago, 
I denied Jesus. I remember sitting, and God has used that for good. And then Matthias. We don't hear much about Matthias after this. A lot of people think for one reason or another that Matthias went to be a pastor, uh, to pastor the church in Ethiopia. But Matthias went in one day from being one of the people who we never would have known his name following Jesus to being one of the twelve. In one day. And I can imagine Matthias looking back. You know, we don't have to wait till we get to the end of the, our lives to reflect on how God has worked through our life, right? Amen? Sometimes it's helpful in the middle of our lives to look back and see how God has worked in our lives. And I can imagine Matthias going, huh, you know, I remember when this happened, and I had no idea what God was preparing me for. Can't you imagine that? And Matthias going, huh, at that time I thought it was about this. But now I can see it was about this day. And God preparing me to be one of the twelve. And so I think about all of you and what you've been through, and, and where you've come from, and why you're here today. And some of you have similar stories to me. Why do you go to this church? Why are you Methodist? Maybe you're not Methodist. And God's got something for every one of you to do. Um, Diane's brother and his wife uh, several years ago lost their 20-year-old son in a car accident. Diane's brother was driving. They were on their way back from a hunting trip. And he wrecked the car and his son died in the accident. And they'll never get over that. And he'll never get over that because he was driving. And we do the what could I have done differently thing, right? But her sister-in-law, Lorraine, she is sort of a counselor. And she has had kids come into her office who need counseling. Really messed up really having a horrible time through things. And Lorraine can say, I feel your pain, right? I know what you're going through. You lost a brother, I lost a son. So that, what a blessing. It's like the the thing that I did a few weeks ago about the young people who were killed in the, in the accident at, from Crown College, and somebody in here told me that they know the mother of one of the kids that I mentioned from West Virginia. I can't remember who it was. Somebody said that they know or their mother knows the mother of one of the young men who was killed in that accident. And the mother was so thrilled that eight years after her son was killed in an accident, that here I am talking about it in Short Gap, West Virginia. And not that she's happy that her son was killed in that accident, but she's seeing how still it's bringing glory to Jesus Christ. So that whatever we do, Whatever we've been through, whatever we're going to go through, God has this unbelievable way of using that to prepare us, like Matthias, 
like Peter. You like computers, don't you? Michael, up here, running this. Flawlessly, I might add. It's hard to pay attention during the hymns and get that just right. Doing a great job. And God's preparing him for something else. And he'll say, I remember, here's how I picture it going for you. Okay? I remember, you know, I, I had to go to church when I was young, or I didn't really want to go. But then this preacher came to this church, and he put this projector up on his second Sunday and didn't even ask anyone. Remember that part when you tell the story. Didn't even ask anyone. And then I wanted to run the projector. And that's what got me in church. And then I became a Christian. And then I became a preacher. <laughs> I don't know about that last part. I'm just saying. You see what an amazing story it'll be? And what a blessing when we can look back, as I'm sure Matthias could, and see God's hand in getting us through it and getting us to what he would have us do. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the way in which you guide us and then when we make the wrong turn or the wrong decision, when we mess up, uh, that you have this way of using that. You have this way of using the difficult times. You have this way of using everything for your glory. And to be honest, there are difficult times that we would rather have not gone through in the past, and I'm sure that there are difficult times ahead that we would rather not go through. But, but what a blessing that the creator of the universe, our creator, uh, what a blessing that you will find a way to help us if, if we will, if we're your children, if we believe in your son Jesus Christ, if, that you will find a way, no matter what we go through, uh, to use that for your glory. And so we can uh, relate a little bit to the giving joy in every circumstance if we believe that somehow that's going to come back uh, to glorify you and to further your kingdom. So I pray for each person here today that they would see, that you would show them some way that you've worked in their past and that you would give each of us the confidence to know that you are already in the future and that you will uh, get us through whatever we face. and that you will not send us out to do your work unprepared. So we give you thanks and praise, and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen.